is it? Here. No. I thought I remembered. No idea. Didn't think I would need it. But it's here. It has to be. It's here. Ah, uh, now that one's mine. Um. No. 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 <laughs> the arrogant way. Every 12 months, we will come together as a community, become stronger together. What? Horseshit. Silly, superstitious trash. And this is why I'm down here? Why am I doing this? After everything that's happened, I finally feel like I'm seeing things clearly for the first time. See how much bullshit this all is. If they're right, I'd be dooming him. I need to do this. I need to find it. Wherever it's been stored away. It never crossed my mind that I would eat it myself, but... But... Way will tell you what to do. The arrogant way. The importance of our masks. One. On the final day of August, every year, we will come together as a community to celebrate the new children brought into our world. We will become Stronger together. The parents of these new children will come together first. I was a new father. A first time father. He was born in July. When I held him. He was so warm in my arms. He squirmed a bit, but did not cry. I think he wanted someone else to hold him. I needed to be strong for him, for my family, for my son. I believe I managed it then. I need to be strong now. I don't see how I can. Eight other parent pairs had children in the previous 12 months. Some of them are new, some repeats. With everything that had happened, like any new parent, I felt overwhelmed. I asked for any advice from the repeat parents. They were nice enough, gave me advice that I had already heard 
countless times over. Even with my whole situation having changed, the advice did not feel any different than before. These repeat parents. Like everyone else in the village, I suppose, knew my situation, what had happened. They didn't seem all too helpful because of that. I still do not know if it was pity or paranoia that seemed to keep them at arm's distance. But something did. With nothing helpful from the repeat parents, I moved on. Spoke with two of the new fathers. But they seemed to be in a similar boat to myself. Overwhelmed. Unsure of what happens next. How they were going to handle this new bundle of responsibility. They, like me, turned this proverb. <sighs> to the pilgrimage. In preparation, the priest will have chosen a pine tree. Starting from the church, the priest will escort the parents to their new tree. That walk through the woods. I walked with him through those woods. He was six years old. My son questioned everything he saw, wanted to know what everything was, what it did, what it was used for, what it ate. I felt such joy being able to teach him everything I could about the world. I am a baker through family, practice, and at heart. Never really considered being a teacher. But that morning, getting to teach him how to see the world, how everything fit together. It was a wonderful feeling. Maybe I could have been a teacher. Maybe I could... He did ask questions I wasn't prepared to answer, mostly due to his age, but even skirting around those topics filled me with such joy, knowing I'd get to have those discussions with him someday, continue to shape his world. Then, just as we had when the priest escorted us to the tree, we came across the cursed house. I didn't notice it. So overgrown I had become over the years, but he noticed the wood wall sticking out from under the moss and brush. He asked what it was. I didn't see what he was talking about. He had to point it out to me. When I saw it, the fear that flooded through me, I stopped frozen in my tracks. He kept walking the path, made it a few more steps before noticing I was no longer beside him. He came back asking again what that wood was. I bent down to be on his level. My voice was probably shaky. If I think about it, I can still feel the same fear I felt then. 
Renewed now. I told him. There are very few places that are off limits in the village. Even for someone as young as him. But that place is off limits. To everyone. No matter their age. I told him. He needed to promise me that he would never go in there. He hesitated, placed his arms behind him, kicked his feet a bit. An act I knew meant he was nervous. I pressed again that he needed to promise me. He took a few moments longer, did not look me in the eye, but did say that he promised. In that moment, I was so afraid. I thought that was acceptable. Three. The new parents must touch the tree's trunk. Thank the Mother Nature for its blessing. But the Mother Nature cannot fully understand our speech, but can understand our tone, our vibrations. Apologize for what you are about to do. The new parents, one by one, will swing with the axe into the tree to cut it down. Then, the whole community will follow, one by one. Through this action, we will be brought closer together as a community. I have been part of this ritual, both before and after my son's birth. But that year, being a new father, one of the first to cut into the tree, even with the axe being familiar, it all felt so much more new. So much more powerful. A strength I needed during that time. After my turn, my one strike, I, like so many others, backed up and turned my head to the sky. Watched the tree as it shook from each cut into it. As the base became smaller and smaller, weaker and weaker, the tree's movement changed. It didn't just shake. Wobbled. That swaying took me back nearly two years prior. It was a celebration, a holiday. And like so many other holidays, food was feasted on and drink was flowing. <laughs> we were all a very loud and merry bunch. Then I saw her, Jezebel. We had already been teasing one another for some time before that. But in the fire's light, the dance she was doing, she was even more beautiful. I joined her and we danced together. At first in a raucous manner, then a more slow one. Swaying in the slightest way. Yet one that made me feel like I was barely attached to the ground. It was love. Fast moving, quick to reach the peak, and quick to end. In less than a year, our love bore a child, my son. Though I didn't know what he would be then. But 
I certainly wished. It was difficult carrying him. Painful for her. The priests were able to help her through it all. But then my son was born and she was... He was gone. I had to be strong for him. But I could not bring myself to search for her mask. One of her family members grew tired of waiting for me to do it. Came over and found it himself. I attended her body's exhibition and burial, but did not speak. Couldn't. Her family did all that as well. I wished my own could be like that, for his sake. I held him in my arms as they lowered her body into the ground. I squeezed him a bit tighter as if that would ensure that he would stay with me longer. He was brought into the world and she was taken out of it. I was grateful for him, for his life, for his health. I would never consider trading his life for hers. But why couldn't I have both? I wanted both. My life would have been perfect if I had just gotten what I wanted. Why couldn't you have given me what I wanted? All the other parents had it all. Why couldn't I? I could have had everything! Everything. For sharing the wood. The priest will use extreme care and precision to evenly divvy up the wood from the tree so that everyone's mask is equal. He was for. He was playing with other kids. They had toys fashioned out of wood and rope. And he wanted all of them. When the other kids and parents wouldn't allow him to have everything, he began to wail. That's when my attention was drawn. I came over, took in the situation, and pulled him aside. The others certainly saw me do it. When I got him out of earshot, I spun him around, got his side of the story. He confirmed what the others had already said. He wanted all of the toys. I guess one of the other fathers had approached around that time. I didn't notice him. I explained to my son that he... He can't have everything. He must learn to accept what little he may get. To share. Equally. He nodded. But I could tell, like so many other lessons I had tried to ingrain in him, that it wasn't taking root. That my words were going in one ear and out the other. 
I told him he's not special. Not inherently. He is just like everyone else in the village and deserves nothing more than what is offered to him in good faith. A lesson I had to learn at a young age. I hope that the more realistic message, though a bit direct and rude, would get through to him. I have no idea if it did, but I asked him if he understood me. He said yes. I didn't buy it, but I had no other way to confirm. I let him go back to the other kids to continue playing. That's when the other father approached me. He did what so many others had done at different times, offered his advice on how to raise my son when I didn't ask for it. He told me that lesson was particularly mean and only served to tear him down. I told him that was a lesson my parents taught me around his age. It was about time he heard it too. He questioned if I, if I had ever considered that my parents were wrong. And if they were, by passing that wrong lesson on to him, that I was continuing a, as he called it, chain of pain. Forging the same links forced onto me and ensuring my son will continue that chain to the next generation and the next. He said it was easy to walk away from it. Just need to recognize it. He assured me my son was special in his own way and that I needed to learn what that was. Play to his strengths so that he may have a chance of making a better life for himself. I, in no veiled tone, sarcastically thanked him for his unprompted help with raising my son. He told me that is why the kid won't listen to me. That attitude. I told him no. The reason my son won't listen to me is because he's simply not old enough to understand the lessons I'm trying to teach him. If he was simply older, if we could just skip a few development stages, he would understand it all. That was a bit harsh, what I had said. I stated I know it's not possible that these are all necessary steps on the path, but I was admittedly worn down by these early stages, just wanted to move on to later ones. The other father still did not speak. I turned back to him, expecting to see him amazed by my logic. Instead, he looked stunned, disbelieving. He said something I didn't understand. Still don't. It was nonsense, like most of what he had said before. Maybe it all made sense in his adult brain, but not to me. He said my son was being leeched. My son to that point had always been healthy. We had never needed to use leeches. Assumptions on his end. Or, like I said, an adult brain, that one. Uh, Uh, fire. Preparing the wood. Pine trees have flay, jagged bark. Each parent will need to cut and sand down the bark to make sure... Make sure it works best in our community. He was... Eight years old. An age where he started to believe he knew everything. An annoying trait that I found difficult to temper. Our village, our community, is 
small but strong and growing. Everything we need is inside the boundaries of our village. We do not go outside of it nor speak with others. He knew that. I had told him many times. But at that age, he began to act like a brat. Defiant. One evening, he was late. He was supposed to come home before the sun started to set. The golden hour was already upon us and he still was not home. With little choice, I prepared a lantern and headed out. I had an idea of where he may have been, somewhere I'd caught him before, just outside the northern skirts of the village. Hadn't been able to figure out what was drawing him out there, but by even towing out of the village boundaries, he was disobeying me. As I approached the edge, I found him, heading back towards home. In an effort to learn more, I made a quick decision to not give him the earful that I'd given him before, and that he so deserved now, to perhaps carefully pry into what he has been doing out here. I joined him, and he clearly expected me to be angry. He clammed up as I put on my best voice to try to hide my anger. I asked him, What's got him so interested in this part of the village? Putting in a lot of effort to feign interest. He didn't take the bait immediately. So, next tactic. I stopped and looked around. He stopped as well. I asked who that person was back where he'd just come from. I didn't see anyone, but I certainly suspected. He stood up stiff. Mm-hmm. Kept looking around, trying to see what I had just lied about. Someone else from our village leaving the boundaries, I asked him. Still no response. That must be your friend Denis. I'll have to be sure to talk to his parents about him leaving the village. That's when he got defensive, started shouting. That it wasn't Denis, it wasn't anyone from our village. An outsider, then. That's when I let loose, began shouting at him for leaving the village again, when I specifically told him to not. Between my words, my lecture, he managed some words. Mentions of always being careful. An accusation that just because I was afraid didn't mean that he was. But in the end, I dragged him back home and he, and he was sent to his room for the evening with no supper. If he was to be a proper citizen of our village, he would need to be shaped. A difficult thing to do when he believed he knew more than me. Six, carve the mask. While doing so, place your wishes into its wood. What do you want for the child? I suppose I wanted what most of the other parents did. He was newborn and healthy. His potential was unlimited. I wished for him to continue to be healthy, to grow strong, to be smart, to do good, to remain honest, to be successful in whatever he wanted to do, to be loved by his pet. 
father, to be liked by his friends, to not be held back by those who express outdated ideas, to change with the times. To not feel alone when surrounded by other family members. To not be cast out. To be forgiven. When needed. I wish... I wish he could have... He could... Live a long and fulfilling life. I wish we could grow strong together. <sighs> I wish that his mother was still there to hold him. I wish we had played more games. I wish I saw him smile more. I wish I could hear his laugh. One more time. <laughs> I wish I could hold him. Tightly. <laughs> I want him back! Please. Give it back to me. Cherishing treasure the mask. Pass it down to them when they are of age. Or use it if they do not. I can't even find it. I failed at this. I know where mine is. I've always known where it was. Kept it handy and in plain sight, though not because of my parents' belief in our ways. It was always for me. I always figured it would be mine that would be needed first. Is that such an unreasonable thought? That I should pass on before my child? It would be him putting my mask up as they lowered my body into the ground rather than the other way around? Because of that thought, I never really kept close track of his. I always figured I would put in the proper search when he was of age, and I would pass it to him. He definitely knew of our ways. I had told him of what would happen in the years to come. That he would need to carve masks for any children that he would have. And I certainly believed he would get the opportunity to have more than one child. I just wanted him to have more than I ever did. A better connection with his family. A better childhood than I got. Live a life more in line with what I wished I had got. My son was being leeched. Damn! He was right. He wasn't getting the life he deserved. I was giving him the one I had wanted for myself. The one I had lost out on. For. I'm so sorry. It 
8. Seven days after the pine tree's removal, with the finished masks in hand, the new pirates will come together again. The priest will give each of them a seed pulled from the tree's cones. In the hole where the stimp, stump has been uprooted, the trees, the seeds will be planted. There, a new tree will grow as as a new generation comes of age in our community. My son will never get the chance to see the tree grow to full height. Will never come of age himself. Won't have kids of his own. Won't repeat our traditions. The tree is still young. Maybe I should tear it down. But they would know. He was laid up in bed. Had been severely ill for almost a month. The priests did what they could, all that they could, but nothing seemed to lead him on the path of recovery. I couldn't believe it. I was watching her death all over again. We had several talks when he was of sound enough mind to do so. What we were going to do when he got better, how we would celebrate, take more walks, do things we should have done far more often. Visit his mother's resting place. The priests said that I needed to keep his spirit elevated. Keep pumping him up with hopeful ideas. There was no root or plant that could work on what ailed him, so he would need strength of his own to pull him up. Despite knowing there had never been a case that was able to overcome this disease. <laughs> it was never said, but we all knew it! <sighs> it wasn't a disease of sickness. It was a disease of the soul. One that created bouts of delirium long times so where he would see something of somebody who wasn't there partake in conversations that weren't actually happening. But I had already fake strength once before. <clears throat> I could do it again. And so we talked. When he could. The last night, he was all together again. He apologized for not listening to me. There was a piece of me that was happy to hear him say that I was right. I hate that the thought was there. But I ignored it. Did what I needed to keep his spirit up. Assured him it was okay. We all make mistakes. I told him of how I had made a mistake with my parents. It created such a storm between us. We did not talk for years. It was only later, as my mother was passing, that I was able to make amends with my father. Realized the whole thing was caused by a misunderstanding. 
One misspoken word and everything had fallen apart. But then we knew the reality of the situation. That there really was no one to blame. Just a mistake. When I finished the story, I noticed how wide his eyes were. There was a moment of believing that I had managed to get a real lesson to settle into his mind. But his eyes did not move. His chest no longer rose. Frozen. I couldn't move. This couldn't be happening. This couldn't have happened. I called for the priest in the house, me still sitting in the chair by his bed. I couldn't bring myself to touch him. Logically, I want to say it was because I didn't want to interfere with whatever procedure they may have tried next. But I was not thinking at all in that moment. There was no logic, only terror. An insane hope that if I didn't move, this somehow would not be real. But it was. The priest came in, in a hurry, did what little more he could, then announced his death. My son was nine years old. That was four days ago. His body has been exhibited for three, as per tradition. Today, they are to lower his body into the ground and bury him. And I need his mask to ensure that his soul can leave it and find its way towards the stars above. I just can't! <laughs> Finally! Here it is! Thank the gods! His spiritual mask crafted by me! And only me. so that his soul may leave his body and find its way towards the zenith above. But will it work? What ailed him, what took his life, was a disease of the spirit. It was four weeks ago. Only four weeks? The sun was setting. He still had not returned home. I headed to the northern part of the village again. Despite the punishments from before, he had done it again. But he was not there. I searched over the village. In the final moments of light, I found him. He was sitting in the field, not far from the cursed house, looking towards it. 
I saw the wood wall sticking out from under the moss and ferns. The fear chilled me again. I called to him, ran to him. He turned his gaze to me, but did not get up. He felt dizzy, he said. I tried to ask, but I couldn't get the question out of my throat. I looked to the cursed house, and his energy seemed to revitalize. He jumped in, telling me, no, he did not go in there. He was just not feeling great. That was all. He tried to stand, but couldn't keep his balance. I picked him up and took him home. He was so warm in my arms. The next morning he seemed fine, went about as usual. But over the next few days, getting out of bed seemed to get harder and harder. It all seemed to work in cycles. For 20 minutes he would feel dizzy, shaky, ill. Then when those 20 were up, he would come back, be totally fine. As if nothing had happened. I guess it made it all too easy to believe that he was fine, overall, to ignore what was happening, to hope. Two weeks in, he couldn't get out of bed anymore, and that was during the good cycles. I had to get the priests. By then, I suppose I knew it. But after they examined him, spoke with him, he finally admitted, slowly, that he had gone into the cursed house. The damn thing that would kill him! It wasn't just that, was it? It was my desperate attempts to shield him, shelter him, to make him into a good community member, to shape him to be just like me, wasn't it? His life was being stolen long before the disease ever could. That's why he became defiant. Wandered outside the village, spoke with outsiders, and believed that nothing would happen if he went into that house. We all are to blame. Aren't we? I am to blame. I'm so 